question? Um, so, uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, what I thought I would do, or I, Jim and I kind of discussed this briefly, what we thought we'd do collectively, we'll talk um, a bit about some of the trends underway right now that are impacting uh, the concerns we have about missiles, um, some additional factors that might accelerate or slow missile proliferation. Uh, and I'll kind of cover that a little bit, and then I'll come to Jim, who I think is going to talk more about some of the more creative, interesting implications uh, of what a world with more and better missiles uh, might look like. So I'll kind of baseline us, I think, a little bit, uh, and then uh, turn to Jim to kind of um, take it from there. Um, obviously, there's a growing role uh, for missiles in deterrence and compellence uh, in war fighting. Uh, this is an important issue for the United States, obviously an important issue for, for many other countries as well. Um, it does seem increasingly that a lot of states are viewing missile forces, both offensive and defensive, as the centerpiece or a centerpiece of their uh, security strategies, whether we're using that to defend their territory, uh, to impede military operations by their opponents, or uh, as a tool of punishment against their opponents, against uh, civilian populations as well as military populations. Um, China, I think it's fair to say, has been kind of leading the way in this regard. I'm sure everyone's pretty familiar with uh, their anti-access area denial strategy and capabilities, this uh, sophisticated network that appears directed against the United States and to a lesser extent perhaps Japan. That includes things like uh, very sophisticated surface-to-air missiles, uh, land attack and anti-ship cruise missiles that can be fired from a variety of platforms, um, and ballistic missiles, surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles, anti-ship ballistic missiles um, that can strike targets uh, on land and at sea. Um, and China's sort of just a pace setter in this regard, but we see Russia, the DPRK, uh, Iran, uh, and a number of other states adopting similar capabilities. We see India and Pakistan are both investing in, in missiles, uh, largely to support their uh, nuclear forces, uh, but for conventional purposes as well. Um, and we see this on the non-state actor side. All right, so Hezbollah is kind of the big uh, classic example of a non-state actor that was really uh, widely regarded for a, having a very large and, and surprisingly sophisticated missile arsenal, uh, but as uh, you know, Henry's uh, mentioned to me and called out, we also have situations like the Houthis, you know, firing ballistic missiles at Saudi Arabia or cruise missiles at uh, naval vessels at sea. Um, so this is a big issue, a big potential problem. Um, the trends, when you look at uh, uh, issues pertaining to missiles, I think really fall into two big categories, right? We have an issue of growing missile sophistication, uh, and growing uh, missile proliferation. Uh, so in terms of the, the sophistication issue, I would just highlight um, four big things, four big ways to think about how missile forces uh, seem to be changing, uh, and not just for the most capable states, but also middle powers and non-state actors. Um, and I think of this in terms of readiness, reliability, uh, range, and accuracy. All right, so we have uh, Increased readiness of missile forces, you have missiles that are moving from um, increasingly for a lot of states from liquid to solid fuel, means they can be uh, prepped and launched more quickly, uh, which makes them harder to uh, destroy or interdict, uh, so that's problematic for uh, those on the defending side. Um, increasingly reliable missiles, missiles that aren't just uh, exploding or self-destructing on launch or in flight, uh, states are testing frequently enough that they're frankly just getting better at producing them um, and producing them in numbers. Uh, range, pretty straightforward, but we have missiles that can cover uh, more targets from more locations. Um, and this is not just an issue of intercontinental ballistic missiles, which obviously is a concern. We see states pursuing those like the DPRK, uh, some states pursuing them more, um, in more subtle ways through the development of space launch vehicles. Um, but this is also about pushing out the range of uh, intermediate, medium, and short range missiles, that they're getting farther, that they can target, uh, target more territory or they can be launched from uh, more locations and, and safer distances. Uh, lastly, probably most importantly, and what I'm sure we'll talk about most, is the accuracy issue. Uh, that states are using a variety of off-board and organic sensors for their missile forces uh, to increase their lethality, um, even at long ranges uh, and even against mobile targets, which are obviously very, very hard to strike. Um, we can talk about this in more detail, but obviously this taps into a lot of different uh, technological developments from networking to get, uh, together different ground-based radars uh, to using updates from satellites to having uh, multi-seeker uh, multi seekers on uh, warheads. Uh, so a lot of issues or a lot of developments that are making missiles themselves uh, much more accurate. Uh, 
Um, so that's a sophistication issue. Missiles are essentially getting better in a lot of different respects. Uh, what about the proliferation issue? Yes, more state, more non state actors are getting missiles. Um, you know, I tend to think of this in terms of two big drivers, uh, fuel and proliferation, kind of a demand side, supply side approach. Um, on the demand side, missiles, especially offensive missiles, are appealing because they are comparatively easy to use, at least relative to a lot of other force projection tools. I um, don't want to oversimplify by saying push button, missile go, but obviously it doesn't require necessarily a lot of coordination, at least for certain types of, of operations. Um, on the supply side, um, you have states like Russia and China, <coughs> but also the U.S. and, and France and Israel and others um, that have both commercial and geopolitical incentives to supply uh, missile forces to various allies, uh, and clients, and partners. So missiles are getting more sophisticated. Missiles are proliferating more widely. Um, what are some factors that might accelerate these trends? They're already a bit worrisome. How could they get worse? Um, so I'll call attention to a couple things that might uh, accelerate, and then a couple uh, retardants, if you will, that might um, slow or cap the consequences of missile proliferation. Um, in terms of accelerants, you know, what might push us to a world of uh, more and better missiles? Um, I think an easy answer and one big factor is this issue of renewed great power competition that we talk about so much, increased competition uh, between uh, the United States, China, and Russia. Um, that has several different implications. Um, first, competition gives Russia and China uh, added incentive to continue enhancing their missile forces because that's obviously one of the things that the United States worries so much about. Uh, so they have an incentive to double down in some respects. Um, two, uh, there's an incentive for the United States to emulate its rivals a little bit. We see that missile forces appear worrisome to us, that they can be effective in a lot of circumstances, so we have an incentive to move into an area which has not been a uh, big focal point for us in terms of defense investment. Uh, and you already see some trends along those lines right now uh, across the services. Um, lastly, competition increases the incentives for major powers and, and regional powers as well uh, to proliferate, again, for commercial but especially geopolitical reasons, right? Building ties with client states, competing with one another for that influence. We see that uh, very vividly right now in terms of uh, UAS or UAV proliferation. Right? You have China in particular that is proliferating some of UAV for a lot of countries, including U.S. security partners, and the U.S. is looking to relax some of its own export control standards so it can actually compete with China so it doesn't lose influence, lose leverage uh, over states it cares about. Um, another potential uh, accelerant, if you will, that I call attention to is really the issue of demonstration effects. Um, and this is kind of a, a mixed one in the sense of, you know, we've had uh, a bit of a demonstration of the problems, the headaches missiles can cause, the damage they can do in the case of the Israel Hezbollah conflict in 2006. We have sort of a virtual or partial demonstration example um, of the impact of missiles simply by looking at the extent to which it's influenced US calculations, the extent to which the United States has had to adapt or is trying to adapt its defense strategy in response to missile threats. But we haven't had a full-fledged demonstration of major powers actually using missiles uh, in large numbers against one another. And if we do, depending on the outcome of that demonstration, it certainly could be an accelerant for the proliferation and growing sophistication of missiles if, frankly, people use them and we see how well they can work. Uh, so that's something to be mindful of. Um, one last issue, I think, uh, just to highlight in terms of um, something that is or could um, lead us to a world of more and better missiles is uh, almost a cult of the missile or cult of the offensive dynamic. If you think about World War I, uh, you had a cult of the offensive in terms of a uh, a, a misestimation of the impact of firepower on the battlefield. Um, a lot of explanations for why that is, but I think you see hints of that today in terms of what states think missiles can do without necessarily a true proof of concept. Uh, so if states really get, frankly, liquored up on the idea that offensive missile forces in particular are extremely effective, um, it'll only fuel this, uh, this trend towards greater sophistication and proliferation, um, even absent a clear demonstration of that uh, being the case. Uh, I will wrap up with, a, uh, with four issues that could, um, if not slow the proliferation of missiles, at least put a bit of a, a governor on um, the impact they could have for states. Um, so kind of on a bit of a <coughs> note, I suppose. Um, uh, the first is cost, right? Very long range, very accurate missiles aren't cheap. Right? There's, so there's simply a limit on how, mu uh, how much resource, state constrained, uh, resource constrained states can invest in missile forces. Um, it may be cheaper than other things, but these are disposable assets that are expensive. 
uh, especially as you get to, uh, again, longer range, more accurate systems. Um, efficiency, right? Missiles are not necessarily an efficient way to do, to perform a lot of military missions, again, because they are disposable assets. Um, <coughs> they are not necessarily an effective way to do things like control territory rather than deny it. So there's things that missiles can do and there's things that they can't do uh, in a really cost-effective way. Um, complexity. You know, I said earlier that missiles were appealing in part because they were comparatively uh, easy for militaries to use. Um, but the more states rely on missiles, the more they, um, the more uh, complex the missions are that they want to use those missiles for, the more defenders invest in countermeasures that make missile attacks at least a little bit harder. Um, the complexity level goes up, the level of training goes up, the uh, level of coordination goes up. So if you think about what China's doing today, for example, in terms of the type of missile campaigns it's planning, uh, you're talking about the potential for very uh, tightly integrated, uh, well-coordinated, uh, sequenced joint operations. Right? That's not an easy thing. That's not an easy thing for any state to pull off, uh, let alone a major power. So that's going to be a potential cap uh, on what states can do. Um, last point I mentioned is just vulnerabilities. Right? As you, again, move to more sophisticated, more accurate missiles uh, that require specialty um, offboard sensor to provide targeting data, you introduce potential vulnerabilities, right? You require, uh, those missiles to strike their targets require more compli uh, complex kill chain. Uh, they require inputs from more sources, uh, updates uh, while they're in flight. Um, that introduces a lot of places where defenders can use both kinetic and non-kinetic tools uh, to uh, disrupt or destroy uh, missile forces. So uh, as the offense seems ascendant in missiles in particular, um, there are opportunities for defenders to uh, implement a lot of countermeasures. So that creates, again, a potential cap uh, on what we can expect missiles to do, uh, and depending on the extent of that uh, limitation on how much states will invest in it. Uh, so with that, I will wrap and I will uh, turn it over to Jim.